Welcome to the first Life to Land lecture. This talk breaks down the three Ds of rewilding in much greater detail than anywhere before, helping you to understand how to apply them on your land. I think of the three Ds as a sort of translator for wildlife. Once you get to know how natural systems work, things around you just sort of start making more sense. You understand ecosystems, the way that animals, plants and their environment interact on a much deeper level. So, I probably don't have to tell you why it's important to think about climate change. It's pretty obvious that the wolf's at the door. We can literally feel the impact of heat rising, increased winter rainfall and summer droughts. But when we switch the conversation to biodiversity, it's often harder to explain to others why we should be acting to stop this biodiversity crisis. It's important. It's a moral outrage. It's pretty. Both the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis are solvable problems. We have the tools in our hands right now to address them. The issue is more one of funding, financial incentives and education. But the difference between these two crises is just how long they'll last. When we finally stop pumping fossil fuels into our atmosphere, scientists reckon it will take thousands of years for Earth to return to normal. That assumes we don't take matters into our own hands and do a bit of geoengineering, pumping it back where it came from, for instance. Still, thousands of years, it's probably worth doing something about, right? But with the biodiversity crisis, the effects are likely to last much longer. And this is something which the public aren't generally aware of yet. When an organism is wiped out, a bee, a mouse, a mongoose, we can't just Jurassic Park them back into existence. And they are being wiped out every day all over the planet, including in the UK. But why should we care about a single individual species when there are literally millions of them out there? It's worth just pausing here a moment and bringing up this phrase which you hear all the time, saving the planet. No doubt when you were at school you were told that taking the bus or picking up litter would save the planet. Back when I was at school I was taught that turning off light switches when we left the classroom would save the planet. What we actually mean when we say save the planet though is save humans because the planet and the ecosystems which thrive on it will continue on long past our existence. There are extremophile organisms which live in the superheated, deeply acidic geysers of Yellowstone and deep sea tube worms which get their carbon not from the atmosphere, from the sun, from photosynthesis like plants, but from toxic sulphur pouring out from the Earth's crust. Even the radioactive contamination zones of Chernobyl and Fukushima thriving in our absence. In short, life will probably be okay, regardless of what we do to this planet. No matter how we manage to kill ourselves off, life uh, finds a way. But humans have evolved for a very particular set of conditions and we rely on a hugely diverse range of species. They pollinate our plants, they provide us with meat, they fertilise our soils, eat pests, clean water, you name it, they do it. In fact, your body is not so much human as it is a collection of different organisms waddling around in a big fleshy lump. Your gut is filled with useful microbes and your skin coated in beneficial bacteria. A 2016 scientific estimate puts your body weight at about 60% bacteria. We are biodiversity. So, when we're talking to others about the importance of protecting biodiversity, we're really talking about the importance of protecting ourselves, our economy, our farms, our forestry, our healthcare system, and our personal health. Scientists reckon that the biodiversity crisis won't last thousands of years, but millions. In fact, many of them are now calling it by a different name, the sixth mass extinction. If you're, if you're not familiar with the first five, then I don't really blame you. They had names like the Ordovician Silurian extinction and the Cretaceous Tertiary extinction. The point is, each extinction was a turning point for biodiversity. It represented a changing of the guards, a new opportunity for life to flourish in its wake. 
that the species which dominated before didn't tend to dominate after. And guess which species dominates right now? Yep, us. So this talk is about how we can not only prevent the sixth mass extinction, but in fact, we are preventing it and even reversing it in some cases and how you can learn from the people who've come before you, what they've done right, what's failed and what works in the context of urban, suburban and rural landscapes. Now, I've been interested in nature since I was a kid in the 1990s, but I've never seen anything like rewilding. I've been to many nature reserves, but I've never witnessed biodiversity bouncing back so quickly and in such abundance as on rewilding projects. That's what's so exciting and what's so noteworthy about this tool that we can use to protect and restore nature and why it's so worth understanding. Many people believe that rewilding is land abandonment or leaving land to heal itself. Technically, that's a sort of extreme form of rewilding, but it doesn't really work in the UK. I'll go into why in a bit. But first, let's take a look at how rewilding came to be, how it evolved from conservation and what makes it different from the previous approach. Rewilding was born in the USA, Yellowstone National Park to be exact. They had a problem. Just like today in Britain, they had too many deer. In fact, their deer were called elk, but you know, same difference, big deer. These elk were eating everything in sight, turning the beautiful wild landscape of Yellowstone from a diverse patchwork into a degraded grassland. Just a hundred years before, this wouldn't have been a problem because the local wolves would have happily eaten these deer up. Unfortunately, when ranchers moved into the area in the 19th century, much of the wolves' prey disappeared. But at the same time, these ranchers had conveniently replaced these prey animals with a bunch of tasty livestock. Naturally, the wolves ate the livestock. So, the ranchers didn't approve of this and decided to shoot the wolves. You might expect at this point that the Yellowstone National Park staff would step in and protect these keystone carnivores, but no, sorry, they poisoned the wolves. That's right, Yellowstone, La Yellowstone National Park poisoned the wolves to protect livestock and more desirable wolf species. Isn't history fun? So, by the second half of the 20th century, Yellowstone was overrun by more desirable species, which turned out to be a bit of a problem. Not only had the habitat become heavily degraded, but beavers had gone extinct because it seems that deer had eaten the trees that they needed to build their homes, their lodges and dams. In the 1970s, as the grey wolf edged towards an endangered species, conservationists started working towards a re reintroduction scheme. This scheme finally took place in the 1990s, just around the time I was saving the planet by turning off light switches, and what a success it was. In fact, the conservationists weren't expecting anything like the impact that happened. When the wolves were reintroduced, the elk population decreased, but wolves also create a landscape of fear. See, that's actually a scientific term. It's worth putting yourself in the deer's shoes for a second here, as it helps you to understand their behaviour. Most people, me included, would assume that when wolves appeared, the elk would spend more time in dense cover, like scrub and forest, but in fact, the opposite thing happened. The reason behind this I experienced myself when I was working in a village in Alaska. Every night, polar bears and grizzly bears would saunter around the streets. One time while I was there, Marilyn, my boss, well, she opened the front door of the hotel and found a grizzly bear trapped inside the porch. After I finished my dinner time shift in the kitchen every evening, I would have to walk across the road and into my own porch, dense cover, like the trees and the scrub in Yellowstone. I'd be happy as Larry walking across that road because I could see for a hundred metres in each direction, but going into that large porch, which had no door and no interior light, that was terrifying. So, like my fear of that shady porch, when wolves were reintroduced to the Yellowstone, the elk started to steer away from these ambush sites, the scrub and the riverbanks in, in particular. You'd find large herds of deer in the open grassland, but as soon as a patch of scrub began to grow up, they'd avoid it. So, scrub turned into woodland, 
especially along the river's edges. And with the return of forested river edges, so too the conservationists saw the return upriver of the beaver. With trees to build dams, these creatures now began to create beautiful new wetlands. The wetlands slowed the flow of water across the land, reducing flooding downstream and improving water quality by trapping sediment and creating home for many aquatic creatures. This waterfall-like knock-on effect where a wolf reintroduction led to the creation of homes for fish is called a trophic cascade. The landscape of fear and trophic cascades are two concepts which are right at the heart of rewilding because this conservation project had become the first rewilding project. It was the inspiration for the three C's. In America, rewilding is defined differently from Europe and the three C's are the way that they define it. Cores, corridors and carnivores. Introduce carnivores to core areas of pristine wilderness and then link up those wilderness areas with wildlife corridors, allowing the carnivores and other species to move from one place to another. Three C's. Easy to remember, right? But the three C's don't really work in Europe. I mean, I don't know if you've travelled around England very much, but I wouldn't describe any of it as pristine wilderness. In America, humans have been around for much less time, and they've lived very lightly on the land in comparison causing little ecological damage until white folks turned up to improve things. Happily enough, the US hit upon the idea of conservation quite early on, so they still have huge, high-quality wilderness areas. In Europe, though, generally, that simply isn't the case. So, in 2019, a paper came out which is now the standard definition of rewilding for Europe. Like in America, there are the three core principles, and they describe these three things as dimensions. The difference between the dimensions and the American model is that rather than connecting up large wilderness areas by reintroducing missing carnivores, they focus instead on reintroducing missing herbivores, plant eaters, to degraded ecosystems like rundown farms and moorland. So, what were the names of these three new dimensions? Dispersal stochastic disturbances and trophic complexity. Well, that last one is similar to diversity. So I sort of helped Purino et al out by rebranding these three dimensions as the three Ds, diversity, disturbance, and dispersal. In the original paper, the authors noted that just like carnivores, large herbivores also have a big impact on ecosystem health. When there were too many, as on an overgrazed farm, the habitat would collapse, but the same thing would happen if there were too few herbivores. Like when wolves, carnivores, were reintroduced in America, in Europe, rewilders found that reintroducing large herbivores would create cascading positive effects on the animals and plants around them, a trophic cascade. The best case study for this is probably the Osphardus plasm. Don't worry about remembering the name or pronouncing it. The Dutch sometimes call it the OBP. It's a large area of a seabed which was drained for agriculture, but then ended up as a nature reserve somehow. The land managers introduced a diverse collection of herbivores, including cattle, ponies and deer. With their introduction, this land turned into a rich mosaic of wetland, scrub and grassland with high biodiversity. So. Rather than just reintroduce carnivores like in the States, based on European case studies like the OVP, the 2019 paper recommends we could try reintroducing large herbivores. Disturbances next. What Perino et al. call stochastic disturbances. Stochastic just means random over time. During World War I, the battlefield was really heavily disturbed, but it also wasn't very biodiverse. Likewise, Ploughed farm fields are extremely frequently and systematically disturbed, but they also have low diversity. So the emphasis here is on occasional random disturbances, which stop the entire ecosystem ending up as woodland, like a wild boar uprooting grass or a bison crossing scrub. That's really hard to say. Because most grasslands, if you leave it long enough, without disturbance, 
will turn into woodland. That's Ecology 101. That's Succession. Dispersal is the last dimension, and this harks back to the wildlife corridors, which we mentioned in the three C's. As I was putting this slide together, a fox carrying a chicken leg was walking right past my window. It's really convenient. That is dispersal. It's moving across the landscape and it's carrying nutrients from one place to another, creating a landscape of fear for chickens. In the European model of rewilding, we don't really use the term wildlife corridors quite as much as in the States. It's worth remembering that a lot of wildlife can walk, it can fly, it can swim or hop from one patch to another, even across hostile terrain in the middle. So stepping stone habitats can be just as useful as a corridor. That said, rewilders still champion projects like wildlife bridges and wildlife underpasses. So that's the basics of the three Ds, diversity, disturbance and dispersal. But in reality, there's a lot more to learn and they're a lot more interesting if you dig a little deeper. Beyond this point, we're starting to veer away from Perino et al. 2019 and pulling together useful ideas from different rewilding scientists, organisations, authors and practitioners. Another way of looking at 3Ds is this. Diversity is measuring how many species are present at one time. Disturbance measures how much that diversity changes over time. And dispersal is how much that diversity flows across the landscape. Each one of these 3Ds is intrinsically linked to the others. Change one and it will have a knock-on effect on the others. Reintroduce a beaver and you're adding diversity, which will create more disturbance and encourage the inwards dispersal of fish, which are more adapted to the slow-moving waters of beaver ponds. Here's a chart I put together and I hope it helps to illustrate the point. This has a number of labels on it which I haven't yet covered, but I'll get to them. Let's take a deeper dive into diversity first. When the public hears about biodiversity, they generally think about one thing, the number of different species found in a particular area. But that isn't the only type of biodiversity, the number of species. In fact, there are a few different things we can measure, and we can think about these on a scale from small stuff to big stuff. Starting at the smallest end of the scale, we're not thinking about ants or bacteria, but about genes, about genetic diversity. Identical twins, well, they have zero genetic diversity. Their DNA is pretty much the same, give or take a few mutations. But each time two genetically different people get freaky, you end up with a kid who has a mix of genes from one parent and from the other. And that much they probably taught you in biology, right? We want that genetic diversity, that new mix of genes, because inbreeding over time can cause health problems, which is why you don't marry your cousin. And a population of species, humans, dogs, cacti, whatever, with more genetic diversity is more likely to survive when something bad happens. Introducing new disease, and you'll find that this genetic diversity means some people have more immunity to that disease than others. And if it's a particularly nasty disease, like black death, then over time you might only be left with those individuals who have the good genes. The same thing is happening right now to our ash trees. There's this nasty fungus which is killing them off. Estimate, experts estimate that a small percentage of them are likely to have genes which will protect them against this fungus. If all ash trees were clones, that is, genetically identical, then this disease would likely wipe out the entire species. Dispersal is essential for genetic diversity. When animals and plant seeds can move around and genes can be swapped from one population to another, you get more diversity. Last year in my garden, I found a whole brood of dragonflies with wings deformed in the same way. These kind of genetic abnormalities are much more likely in isolated populations, like those cut off in urban areas, where dispersal is made much harder by the lack of suitable habitat. So, that is genetic diversity, the smallest bit of diversity. Next up is the one you're probably familiar with, species diversity. You probably know about food webs from school, right? Each branch on a food web represents the flow of nutrients between two species. One eats the other. They look like this. Simple food web, right? Well, 
This is a partial food web for one ecosystem. As you can see, it's a bit like a machine learning algorithm. We can try to understand it, but realistically, the best approach is just standing back and appreciating the end result, the astronaut riding a horse. Remove one species from this ecosystem and the knock-on effects are impossible to accurately predict. But if we do it often enough to enough ecosystems, we can start to see trends, patterns. The same is true with species reintroductions. We may not understand the full complexity of a species role in its ecosystem, but we can have a good idea of the magnitude and the type of an impact that a reintroduction will have on other species and on its habitat. Not because we can look at these food webs and make predictions based on this complex network of connections, but simply because we have examples of where we've done the same thing before, evidence of what works and what doesn't from previous reintroductions. While most rewilders focus on animal reintroductions, I carry the flag for plants. They're not cute and they're not cuddly, but they are cheap and they're easy in smaller projects. You're unlikely to reintroduce a bison or a beaver to a garden, a small holding, or even a farm, but you might reintroduce a threatened tree species. In fact, I have on my own land. Part of the reason I emphasise the importance of this complex, hard to understand food web is because it, it, it explains why native species are so important. Native species are organisms, plants, animals, fungi, whatever, that arrived on our, our island since the last ice age without human help. That's the definition. When you've been friends with someone for a long time, you develop your own language, your own in-jokes, your own references, and you develop this trust for one another, at least I hope you do. That's similar to native species. They've been around each other in the same ecosystem for so long that they develop this complex relationship and they really depend upon each other. That's why it's so important to plant native trees, flowers and shrubs, because our wildlife has co-evolved with them, relies on them for food, shelter, hunting, nesting, so many things. In fact, it's why I spent some of last year developing a free website to make it easier to find and buy native plants, bynative.co.uk, and why Life to Land includes a tree list with even more native species than that. We have a lot of native trees. Many are genuinely beautiful and useful too, and we only tend to use a few of them when planting out new projects. It's very normal to see a planting scheme with only five or six different species of tree. But visit a wild woodland and you might find 10 to 30 species. You have a genuine opportunity to create more biodiversity on your land from the ground up. And it's really easy too, just a case of buying the plants and sticking them in. The next level up in diversity is functional. Some species basically do the same thing as others. I mean, not exactly the same, but close enough that only their mother would be able to tell the difference if you swap one out and replace them with the other. So we do. Wild boar are a dangerous animal, but pigs can be kept safely and sold for meat. So rewilders who are not even permitted to keep wild boar because they're listed under the Dangerous Wild Animals Act have no choice but to opt for the functional replacement and make do with pigs. But pigs do a great job. They're not native, unlike wild boar, but they do the same sort of stuff to the ecosystem and you get pork chops. The same goes for cattle. Yes, ideally we would have aurochs, the wild native breed of cattle, which used to be found in Britain, except that they're now extinct. So a very enterprising group of people managed to breed back in most of the traits of an aurochs into a modern day cow. And the result, uh, a terrifying thing, which looks like this. And like most cattle, they have a tendency to attack dogs, so instead of these, we have a functional replacement for a functional replacement, the Highland Cow. This breed, which looks and acts like a massive stoner, even when dogs are around. Functional diversity is not just key to reintroductions like these examples, but it's also key to overall ecosystem health. Even a tree has its functions a thick trunk that's valuable for nesting holes, wide branches which create shade, edible leaves for insects to munch, 
If you're missing a lot of species and want to start restoring your habitat, it's worth thinking about what functions need to be restored and replaced. One tree species is better than none at all, but even an upright log or a nest box can start to restore some of the trunk's functions before the actual tree grows at all. Think like an animal or a plant, and you may get inspiration for some interesting nature positive solutions. Just remember that nature is more complex than we can ever really understand, so it's worth complementing rather than replacing functions. On the next level up in diversity is structure, the shape of a habitat. Structural diversity is created by vegetation and terrain, and it affects everything from shade to humidity, wind patterns to animal movement. At every level, we're aiming for more diversity, though there are small exceptions like bogs, where you want extremely flat land, not lumpy stuff really. Structure is extremely valuable, especially on farmland and in urban and suburban areas. You'll often find large expanses of grass and hard surfaces, and these act like barriers for many animals. Crossing them, whether on foot or by wing, risks being captured by a predator. So, many smaller mammals and birds will avoid open areas. Now this makes big lawns and wide expanses of paving with no shrubs and trees a real problem for dispersal. A genuinely healthy wild woodland has ground flora, a scrub layer, small trees and large trees, but most of our woods, including our planted woodland, only has a top and a bottom layer. The middle, the scrub and the small trees, well that's missing. And this layer is a crucial bridge which boosts the species diversity of the ecosystem by allowing dispersal of animals from the canopy down to the ground and vice versa. So remember, when you're planting trees, that eventually they will be huge, some of them anyway, and interspersing big trees with smaller trees and shrubs that thrive in the shade well, that's a great way to bridge that gap from canopy to ground. You can also underplant mature existing trees with shrubs and smaller trees to recreate this structural diversity in existing ecosystems. Our hedges tend to be straight and narrow, but in the wild, no such structure exists. Instead, you get patches of scrub with uneven, raggedy edges that create sheltered sunny bays and exposed windy headlands. These have trees popping out at random intervals, throwing shade over the scrub below. Now you can create the same effect in a new or an existing hedgerow. It's called scalloping. You make them look like a coastline with pointy out thick headland, head, headlands and thinner bays. Allowing sections to grow taller or planting emergent trees into the hedgerow well, that will improve that structural diversity. Just be wary of letting a tightly clipped hedge grow too tall as you'll start to lose that structure and density at the base, and it won't be much good as a boundary, especially against livestock. The final layer in our diversity cake is the habitat. A habitat is a community of different organisms living together in the same kind of conditions. For example, acid grassland is a collection of wildflowers, grasses, scrub, moss, lichen, fungi, and animal species, which flourish in places where the soils have a pH below 5.5. Depending on how nerdy you want to be, there are hundreds of different habitat types in the UK. In fact, there's a system for classifying them that I find to be quite useful called UK Hab. It breaks them down into different levels of nerdy, nerdiness. Level one is just, is it on land, fresh water, or is it in the sea? Level five includes such gems as Lollium Cynosaurus neutral grassland. In fact, the UK HAB system underpins life to land, so I've spent rather too much time looking at it, to be honest. If you want more information about management of each habitat type, then you can go to the habitat section on life to land, because each habitat will respond differently to your management, and it requires a different management approach. While rewilding is typically thought of as letting go, there's actually a lot of ongoing work, or at least a lot of forethought which needs to go into habitat management during the establishment of a new ecosystem. 
Habitats will tend to shift towards woodland over time. In most cases, that's succession again. But as each habitat has its own community of species, then a landscape which is rich in habitats is also rich in species. Rewilders often talk about mosaics. You can add that one to your list. Alongside Tropic Cascade, Landscape of Fear and the Three Ds. Mosaic landscapes have a diverse collection of different habitats with lots of edges. As one habitat fades into another, you get this beautiful slope of succession, which ecologists call an ecotone. For once, I think they've got this branding right, and an ecotone where two habitats meet is very diverse because you've got the diversity of one ecosystem, the community from one, and the community from another, and they just kind of fade into one another like this. It's really romantic, really. It's like the union of two fleshy blobs of bacteria and human. So that's diversity ticked off. From small to big, you've got genetic, species, functional, structural, and habitat diversity. Maximise each one of these layers and you'll maximise your ecosystem's health and its resilience to shocks like climate change, pollution, the loss of any one individual species and the arrival of an invasive species or a predator. Before I head on to disturbance, perhaps it's worth a very quick detour from the science to chat about my own experience. I have about 3.5 acres of land, that's roughly two football pitches, or to put it in a more accessible term, uh, terms that I can actually relate to, it takes me about five minutes to walk from one end to the other. I bought this by remortgaging my flat in January 2022, this one, and immediately put into practice the things I've been telling you about today. I planted 600 trees to start with, and I now have 28 there. Most of them are native, uh, 28 species that is, most of them are native, and the ones which aren't, apple and walnut, are growing for, for food production. At the same time as my trees went in, I had a grant to put in seven ponds, which were installed with massive excavators. Alistair Driver, the director of Rewilding Britain, describes rewilding as a marathon with a sprint start. There's a whole lot of work to begin with. You've got to undo all of the tidying up that we've done really carefully over the past few millennia, to create opportunities for wildlife to flourish and to begin taking back control of this e ecosystem. You see, that's what disturbance is really about. It's about letting some chaos back in. There are really two levels to this disturbance. The first is what you need to do to get an ecosystem back to its wild state. That's like a hard reset. It's why I mentioned before that just abandoning land, well, it doesn't really work in Britain. Much of our land is really quite degraded. It's been ploughed, it's been drained, it's been fertilised, sprayed with pesticides. We've removed the rocks, we've neutralised acid soils with lime, and we've killed off much of our larger wild carnivores and herbivores. So we need to undo all that work. We need to recreate a wild landscape by removing field drains or rerouting them in ways that create wet patches by stopping the use of fertilisers and pesticides altogether, at least definitely pesticides, adding bumps and lumps back in, including ponds. But that really isn't enough because we're still there missing that diversity. And diversity creates the second type of disturbance, the ongoing wild disturbance of ecosystems. In a wild British ecosystem, before humans popped up, herbivores would be doing all kinds of useful stuff. Digging in the soil or rooting, eating back the grass and leaves or grazing, chewing on branches and bark, browsing, which kills bits of the tree or even the whole tree, crushing scrub and small trees, gnawing through the base of trees, pushing trees over, doing their business, and even creating wallows. Much of this wonderful disturbance is lost from our modern landscape, or it's become so common or so regulated with such a high amount of one specific activity that the ecosystem is really weirdly shaped, like the deer and sheep damage which create gappy woodlands, so-called sheep wrecked, the fertilising and the ploughing which makes arable fields, or the excrement-enriched dog-walking lawns which are so covered with doings 
that only grass can survive. Now, in the absence of natural disturbance on a rewilding project, humans need to recreate it. We need to be the functional replacements for these herbivores. So, if there are no wild boars to root through the soil, we need to turn it over ourselves by hand from time to time. If we're missing bison and beavers, then we need to hack back trees and scrub occasionally to allow more light to reach the forest floor. Coppicing is a great example of this kind of nature-positive land management. It's not just animals which create disturbance though. Water also pushes through the landscape, changing the scenery on the way. But much of our land is drained with field drains, which are basically tubes under the surface of the soil, and with ditches running along the edges of these fields. These ditches, well, they connect to straightened, narrow, high-banked streams, very unlike the wild, shallow and meandering streams of our past. These flow into channelised rivers with reinforced banks and even concrete sides in some places. It's not surprising then that we have issues with water flow, with river health, aquatic biodiversity, with drinking and bathing water quality. In many places, landowners are taking things back. They're taking things into their own hands and reversing this destructive process. Over in the Lake District at Wild, Wild Horsewater, the RSPB has re-wiggled a river, restoring its natural meanders. Here in 2023, salmon spawned for the first time in many years, as the river had once again become clear and natural enough for them to do so. These salmon though, well they were just the tip of the iceberg and indicated that just below the surface, everything else was also running smoothly again. Over on the Belmont estate, not very far from where I live, I watched last year as a huge excavator carved out a new river channel I, alongside the existing river, except that this new channel was higher up. Water would be rerouted into it from the degraded, dredged watercourse, which was hardly fit to be called a river anymore. The new path was winding and not straight, and it included pockets of wetland that would trap sediment and floodwaters and improve the quality of water downstream. In cities, towns and even in rural areas, many streams and rivers have been buried below the surface or even piped over ground. There's one in a London tube station which literally passes through a tube across the tracks. These hidden watercourses, culverts, could once again be revealed in future landscapes and are in some cases, boosting local biodiversity, reducing temperatures, creating beautiful wild spaces and a green corridor through urban areas. This practice is known as daylighting, and some good examples of it are the Porter Brook in Sheffield and a stream at the heart of Seoul in South Korea. The key here is not just to restore daylight, but also to plant natural vegetation. Riparian trees, marginal plants at the river's edge, which massively boost the biodiversity and the aesthetic appeal too. For contrast, just take a look at the difference between this fake daylighted stream in Bloomberg Arcade, which is a London shopping precinct, over the path of an existing um, underground culvert, and compare it with the previous example in Seoul. There's just no comparison really. Whether you're a farmer or an architect, daylighting streams can create more biodiversity, allowing you to benefit not just from their aesthetic beauty, but also from the biodiversity credits which are associated with this kind of high impact restoration project. One final thing about disturbance, it's important to remember that death is also a natural form of disturbance, but it's one that we don't tend to tolerate in our landscape. Dying and dead trees and animals are incredibly valuable for biodiversity. Any attempt to leave them in place where it's safe to do so will return nutrients to the soil create breeding opportunities for invertebrates, mammals and birds, and restore a healthier, more complex food web. On to dispersal, the final dimension. So, we've already covered some things about this. You know how important dispersal is for maintaining genetic diversity. You know from the fox and the chicken leg example that dispersing animals can move nutrients around. In fact, migrating fish dispersing up rivers carry huge amounts of nutrients from the sea up towards the hilltops against the force of gravity. 
That's why removal of unnecessary dams and weirs can be so valuable for enrichment of farmland. We know that dispersal is blocked by huge expanses of lawn or paved area, concourses, roads, car parks. It's also blocked by large areas of non-native vegetation, like cereal crops and conifer plantations. You might remember from the 3Ds diagram that fences and walls can block dispersal too, but we can do something about each one of these challenges. We know that native plants are better for biodiversity, in fact, dispersal tells us that local plants are even better. If you create a bog in a desert landscape, you, mo you won't get many animals and plant seeds arriving. This is an extreme example, obviously, but bear this in mind when designing a planting scheme. If you're planting a beech tree, check that there's a beech woodland in your area or beech present in the nearby hedges. If not, how will the species which depend on that tree, the insects, the birds, the fungi, how will they disperse into your project? Let's twist that around and think about it another way. Think local. Visit a nature reserve nearby on the same soil type and take inspiration from the plants and the trees you see there. That way, you'll know that your planting scheme will benefit from a surge of incoming biodiversity, all of these animals, as it becomes established. But... Dispersal is best on projects which are physically connected to the wider landscape. So, whenever you put in a physical boundary or an obstacle, consider how wildlife are going to get past it. Whether that's a hedgehog hole or a badger gate in a fence, a line of trees across a lawn, a green break in a row of houses or a wildlife underpass below a road. Any large open area is a barrier, but creating miniature stepping stones across it can help with dispersal. Tiny pockets of dense vegetation, or at the very least, large trees. So, that is the three Ds. Diversity, disturbance and dispersal. The science of rewilding. But there are a few things which are missed when we only talk about the science. In fact, even the 2019 paper on the three dimensions covers this missing link. Rewilding is also a philosophy. It's about working together sharing ideas, sharing spaces, because no rewilding project has ever been successful without buy-in from the local community. Every project needs to offer something of value to the wider world. New jobs, walking paths, forest school, orchards, foraging towards bird hides. In a garden setting, the rewilding has to work in the context of the many other functions of this space. Wheelie bins, driveway, bike storage, washing lines. You can find out much more about the philosophy of rewilding from Rewilding Europe. These are their rewilding principles. My own philosophy is that rewilding is not relevant to every patch of land. If you eat food, and you probably do, then that food has to come from somewhere. You have a farmland footprint. Whenever we take farmland and rewild it, what we end up doing is shifting that farmland footprint somewhere else. When we take land out of production in the global north and instead convert pristine habitat to farmland to replace it in the global south, not only are we not solving the issue of biodiversity loss, but we're also exporting our problem to a country where environmental standards may be lower. A country which may already have a history of exploitation by the global north. So I always advise against rewilding productive arable land, and I'm now also beginning to question, question whether we should be tearing up all our conifer plantations for the very same reason. Doing this isn't actually solving a problem. It's not necessarily helping the overall fight to fix the biodiversity crisis. Instead, it's just shifting the issue to somewhere we can't see it. I'll leave you with this. I took on my own project in January 2022. It was a degraded pasture, not being used for sheep grazing, cow grazing, not for anything. It was effectively abandoned land. When I visited it the previous summer, there were no butterflies on the site at all. It had been mowed every year. By summer of the second year, there were over 200 individual butterflies on the northern half alone in one official count. From spring 2022 to spring 2023, the abundance of birds on my land went up 49% in an official survey. Rewilding works. It works quickly 
and it is the most effective tool we have for fighting the biodiversity crisis. But it is not the only tool, and it's also worth exploring other options, from permaculture to regenerative agriculture, many of which are detailed on Life to Land. When you next walk out onto your land, think about the three Ds and look at the world around you. Consider how each one of these dimensions has shaped the ecosystem you stand in, how the interplay of them is what creates healthy, resilient habitats. And keep this idea in mind when you're planning out the next stage in your project. Good luck, and thanks for watching. <laughs> that was a fox barking, and I was heading into this. <laughs>